It is with much respect and admiration that I introduce to you Dr. David Viscaccio, who is going to lead off this NF1 section. And as we've been doing throughout the weekend, as an icebreaker, I pose the same question to our esteemed speaker. If you were to go back in time and you wanted to meet one significant person, who would that person be? And I pose the question. It's all yours. Thank you. All right. Well, as you can see, I'm from the Division of Medical Genetics, but I really don't want to meet Mendel. I just don't, you know, some guy that works with those peas and there's only uh, seven chromosomes to work with, I just, I'm not that interested. But I would love to have been a cabinet member on Abraham Lincoln's cabinet to see what uh, transpired in those uh, four years. And who knows, maybe we're in that same dynamic change within our country right now that uh, the same type of uh, changes are happening that uh, you can reflect back and say those were pretty significant times. So yeah, I'd say Abraham Lincoln. Thank you. Great. So I think today, this is meant to be the beginning of dialogue. You know, we have a full day, and it is a full day. I looked at the schedule, and you're sort of tied in the, the whole day. Um, hopefully the kids can last. I suspect they'll last better than uh, the rest of us will. But uh, this is really a dialogue to start up. I, I don't consider myself uh, a, an expert in any way in the clinical trials, but to give you a little historic perspective, uh, I know John was, was talking about the University of Michigan and Francis Collins and Michigan finding the gene. Well, there was a little bit of a competition that was going on about that time. And Peggy Wallace and myself, we, we got to know each other pretty well um, in that time frame. But my mentor was Ray White, and uh, we just had, last week, we had the 30-year anniversary of Ray White and his colleagues, including Mark Skolnick from Myriad Genetics. They came back together to Utah and talked about this whole process of what we call um, restriction fragment length polymorphisms. They were up at Snowbird. Those of you who have been to Utah, you probably know Snowbird and Alta. It's a beautiful place, especially if you have skis on your feet and the powders just come in. But uh, they were at a meeting and, and put their heads together. They'd been, one of them was uh, very strong in Drosophila genetics, and they realized that if you could pin down a genetic marker on a chromosome and then collect families and actually do marker studies, you could find where genetic conditions mapped on the chromosome. And of course, at that time, we knew that genes were the, the primary responsibility for genetic conditions. And so then, if you knew the location on the chromosome, you could hone down on it. You could pin down and start physically mapping that area. At that time, when Peggy and I were in the trenches, it took, uh, well, it was a good part of two and a half, three years to actually find the, the NF1 gene. Nowadays, it's probably two and a half weeks, especially if you're quite good at the computer and you can look at the genome and you can make a deduction about this is what this particular gene codes for, this protein, and this is what it might do biologically. So it was pretty heady times back then when, when Dr. White was uh, carrying forth with, uh, with mapping different uh, genetic conditions, including NF1. And then from there on, the physical mapping took off. So I was one of those at the bench and looking for, um, looking for the NF1 gene, trying to think, OK, this is going to, to change how we approach this condition. And in fact, it has. But my goodness, it's taken a long time. Um, that gene was identified in uh, 1991, and it's taken us now, we're 20 years into it, where we're now, I believe, starting to, to do logical clinical trials, where we're, we recognize the biochemical pathway, we feel like we're not doing harm by just subjecting someone to any drug that comes along. And I think you heard from Dr. Korf last night that it's really targeted now. We really have a targeted approach, and I think you'll hear from Tina as well on um, Dr. Razor on, on the, um, the uh, plexiform neurofibromas and why certain medications are being used. So I don't view myself as a clinical trialist. It's just when you, when you stick with this condition as long as 20 some odd years, you get to a point where you say, okay, it's fine and dandy to have the gene. It's, it's good to know what that genetic change is. We're now coming to that point where it now seems to be making a difference, or at least in the next five to ten years it may make a difference. 
But you see enough families and you recognize we have to do something about this condition and we, the only way we're going to do it is by clinical trials. And so my role, what uh, Trace Ann asked me to talk about today is the clinical trials, at least the experience that I have. And I'm only going to provide you an overview. What I'd like to do in the next uh, 20 um, some odd minutes is to um, just share with you my thoughts about the academic, the importance of having clinical trials within academic centers where people think about clinical trials, but then take you that next step where uh, Dr. Korf left you last night, where he was speaking, addressing to the, um, how do you find out about these clinical trials? And then we'll just go through, and I've just recently gone back through the um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov website to see how many of the NF1 trials are, are, are within that website. And I thought we'd just go through that in case you're not familiar with it. And I learned a little bit from it just by looking at the map and knowing how many trials are actually out there. All right, so clinical trials, definition of terms. I think uh, last night you heard from, uh, from Dr. Korf a little bit about clinical trials, the goals of trials. We'll go through this um, over, uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, the um, protocol development, I wanted to address protocol development and spend a little bit of time on the human subject uh, protections because that probably sets clinical trials apart from any other just random, let's try this medication. Um, to, to protect the subjects who are part of clinical trials, it's become a fairly elaborate process and I think it's an important process that's now becoming a little bit more streamlined. I wanted to talk a little bit about recruitment and enrollment and then endpoints, which is the bottom line of a clinical trial. What, what are you left with it at the end? And then finally, the most important thing is going from a clinical trial to standard of care so that you don't necessarily have to go through a clinical trial. We now recognize this is an important um, protocol that works and then it becomes uh, useful in not just academic centers, but hopefully um, it, it could even uh, tie in with other centers. But generally, the, these kind of protocols really are best handled, I think, in, a, in an academic center. And most academic centers now are linked with the CTF-sponsored um, NF clinics. So that's one thing that's happened in the last few years is that the organization is now in place. We just need to take it forward in the clinical trials, results of clinical trials, and application of standard of care or guidelines for care is what we're really shooting for. Okay, so what is a clinical trial? This is the definition that comes from clinicaltrials.gov. I think uh, Dr. Korf presented it last night. So it's uh, studies on human beings that follow a predefined protocol. And that's the key thing, is defining what that protocol is even before you start. So there's treatment, prevention, diagnostic protocols, there's screening protocols, and even quality of life where there's really, you're just getting feedback from the families without any intervention whatsoever. So you've heard about these phased trials and primarily um, we're in the phase one, phase two trials. Once you've shown something's effective, then you can move on to larger groups of people to confirm the effectiveness. Now this is probably something that we won't be moving on to just because there's not that many individuals with NF1 who have a particular manifestation that allows you to get that kind of large information. We're talking about hundreds and, and even thousands of people sometimes when you go from phase three to phase four trials. Um, especially the phase four where you're looking at post-marketing studies and um, that's driven by other needs than what our um, clinics have. So the goals of trials, I think, primarily are to come up with a better protocol, a better treatment, more effective, less risky. And nowadays, you have to think about expense. Um, even though the caps are going to go up for your how much treatment can somebody have in their lifetime, it was, I think, a million and, and two, and now it'll probably be climbing up so that there won't be these caps on your lifetime um, insure, uh, insured um, coverage. 